and welcome to my Edexcel Combined Science Biology Paper 1 speed run designed for a final boost just before the exam. So, topic 1 key concepts. Cells are the basic unit of all living organisms. Animal cells and plant cells all contain cytoplasm, nucleus, ribosomes, mitochondria and cell membrane. And plant cells also contain vacuoles, chloroplast and a cell wall. The organelles are the parts of a cell. The nucleus controls the cell and contains DNA. The cell membrane controls what enters and leaves the cell. Cytoplasm is where chemical reactions happen in the cell. Ribosomes make proteins. Mitochondria are where aer aerobic respiration happens to release energy. And chloroplasts are where photosynthesis happens and contain. Bacterial cells have many of the normal features of a cell, including ribosomes, um, a cell membrane, a cell wall, and cytoplasm. However, they do not have a nucleus. Instead, they have their DNA as chromosomal DNA, this large piece there, and plasma DNA, a much smaller piece there. Some bacteria also have flagella to help them move. Microscopes. The magnification of a microscope is how many times bigger an object appears than normal. To work out the magnification, you multiply the magnification of the eyepiece lens by the magnification of the objective lens using that equation there. To find the size of something from a micrograph, you measure its actual size uh, in millimetres, then you divide that by the magnification here using this equation. You may need to multiply by a thousand to convert something into micrometres too. Standard form is a way of representing numbers that are very big or very small. Um, for example, 2.54 times 10 to the power of 6. That 6 tells you how many places you put here after the first number. To have numbers smaller than 1, so they have a negative power of 6, um, the power this time tells you the decimal point that you start writing your number on. So that's starting on the sixth one because it's times 10 to the minus 6. We did a call practical using microscopes, so we placed a sample on a slide. We stained the slide with iodine to show up the features. We placed a cover slip over the slide to protect it. We placed the slide on the stage, which is just there. We selected the objective lens there, and we used the rough focus, which is here, to get a rough image, and use the fine focus to produce a clearly crisp, sharp focused image. Enzymes are proteins that are found inside every cell and they speed up chemical reactions. They work on the substrate. The substrate is a chemical with a specific shape that the enzyme works on. Now the substrate fits into part of the enzyme called the active site that has the matching shape for the substrate. The substrate goes into the active site forming an enzyme substrate complex. The uh, reaction takes place and the uh, the substrate turns into the products, the products leave the active site, and the active site is then ready for another substrate to enter. A particular type of enzymes is digestive enzymes, so fat is digested uh, into uh, glycerol and fatty acids by an enzyme called lipase, and that happens in the small intestine. Proteins are digested into amino acids by a enzyme called protease, and that happens in the stomach and the small intestine. And then starch is digested by an enzyme called amylase into simple sugars. The whole point of digestion is to break large food molecules down into ones that are small enough to absorb into the blood. Um, enzymes can be denatured. Normally, the active site of an enzyme has the matching shape for the substrate. However, sometimes the active site changes shape, so it no longer fits the substrate, and this stops the enzyme from working. And this can be caused by high temperatures and very high or very low pH. The core practical on uh, enzymes involved testing the effect of change in the pH on the rate that amylase could digest starch. We did this by monitoring using iodine solution. Iodine turns black in the presence of starch. So we took a test tube of starch, a test tube of amylase and the pH buffer and we warmed them to 40 degrees Celsius in a water bath. We mixed the tubes and started the timer. Every 30 seconds we took a sample out and put it into a little spotting tile well full of iodine and if it went black we continued repeating the experiment and if it stopped and didn't change colour, stayed this nice orange brown of iodine, then that meant all the starch had been digested and we stopped the timer, then we recorded the time and we repeated this with different pH buffers. To understand how things enter and leave cells, we need to understand the concept of concentration, which is the number of particles in a given volume. If we look at this example here, we can see that this one has a low concentration, this one has a high concentration because there are more particles in that uh, one on the right. Here, the concentration of red is lower than blue because there are fewer reds. Here, the concentration of red and blue is equal because there's the same number of reds and blues. In this one, the concentration on the right is lowest because although all of these guys contain seven, in the one on the right, they're in the smallest volume, so therefore the concentration is higher. 
Diffusion is how most substances move in and out of cells from high concentration to low concentration down a concentration gradient. You can see that happening in the bottle. The stuff is high concentration in the bottle and it leaves the bottle towards low concentration. This is how oxygen goes from the lungs to the blood and carbon dioxide goes from the blood to the lungs. It's also how carbon dioxide goes from the air into the leaf and how oxygen goes from the leaf back out into the air. Osmosis is how water enters and leaves cells. It is the diffusion of water across a partially permeable membrane. A partially permeable membrane is one like this, which has small holes that are small enough for water to go through, but too big for dissolved substances like sugar to go through. So water diffuses from high concentration to low concentration down a concentration gradient. The concentration of water is higher wherever the concentration of solute is lower. Active transport decides how substances go from low concentration to high concentration up a concentration gradient. For example, how minerals go into roots from the soil or how sucrose enters sieve cells in the phloem. There are proteins in the cell membrane that grab molecules from the low concentration side and move them to the high concentration side using energy as they do so. The osmosis core practically involves taking potato chips of similar sizes, recording their mass and placing them in sugar, sucrose solutions of different concentrations and leaving them for 15 minutes and then re-weighing them and calculating the percentage change at the end. What we found was that the ones in the lowest concentrations of sugar increased in size because by osmosis water entered them and the ones in the lowest concentration uh, of sugar decreased in size because water left them by osmosis. Topic two, cells and control. So cell division is the process of making new cells. Cells can either be diploid with 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 total, or haploid with 23 single chromosomes, so 23 chromosomes total. Nearly every cell in your body is diploid. The only haploid ones are your sperm and eggs. Diploid cells are made by mitosis in which one diploid parent cell makes two genetically identical diploid daughter cells. Um, it starts with interphase, which is actually the day-to-day -day life of a cell and not part of mitosis. But mitosis proper starts with prophase, in which the nucleus breaks down and spindle fibres start to appear. During metaphase, the spindle fibres are fully formed and the chromosomes start to align themselves along the centre of the cell. In anaphase, the, spin the um, chromosomes start to move to each end of the cell, uh, down those spindle fibres. And in telophase, the new nucleus starts to form around each set of chromosomes. And finally, we have cytokinesis, where the new cell membranes form and the cell is now fully separated. Haploid cells are made by the process of meiosis, in which one diploid parent cell makes four genetically different haploid cells. And this makes the gametes, so your sperm cells and egg cells only. Stem cells are a type of cell that can do differentiation. Differentiation is when a cell divides to make two different types of specialised cell. So a stem cell is a cell that can differentiate. And you can see that process here with the stem cells in the middle making all these different other kinds of cell around the outside. The nervous system uh, collects information and makes decisions and it is based on impulses, electrical messages that travel down nerve cells called neurons. Um, there are different types of nerve cells such as sensory neurons that gather information from the senses. We have relay neurons in the brain and the spinal cord, that's the central nervous system. They make decisions and motor neurons carry messages from the central nervous system back down to the muscles to make actions. Neurotransmission is the process of passing a nerve impulse from one nerve cell to another cell and that involves chemicals called neurotransmitters being released across the gap between two nerve cells which is called a synapse. The reflex arc allows us to very quickly make decisions without having to think about it to keep us safe. So a stimulus is detected by a receptor cell that sends a message up a sensory nerve to the central nervous system, relay neurons in the central nervous system make a decision and pass an impulse back down a motor neuron to a muscle to make a decision such as moving the other way. Topic three, genetics, is about the structure of DNA and alleles. So DNA is made uh, up of chromosomes. A chromosome is a large piece of DNA. Uh, DNA contains genes, which is a section of DNA coding for a single protein. DNA has a double helix structure. Complementary base pairs, C, G, and A, T are the ones that pair up. A sugar phosphate backbone, you can see that there. And weak hydrogen bonds that join down the middle of the bases. Alleles are different versions of the same gene. Alleles can either be dominant or recessive. So dominant is one copy is needed to show the characteristic. Recessive means two copies are needed to show the characteristic. You can be homozygous or heterozygous. So homozygous means you've got two of the same allele. Heterozygous means you've got two different copies of the allele. And finally, you've got your genotype and your phenotype. Your genotype is the genes that you have and the phenotype is the characteristics that result from these genes. So if we look here, for example, this person here is homozygous dominant. That means two copies of the same gene. Uh, that's their genotype and the dominant gene. And the phenotype is to have brown eyes. This person here is homozygous recessive with two recessive alleles of the gene. And that is going to give them blue.
blue eyes, this person here is heterozygous, meaning one copy of each gene. That's the genotype. And the phenotype is that they're going to have brown eyes. So your genes are inherited from your parents. You get one, uh, if you've got two alleles of each gene, you get one from each parent. Um, and that can be shown with things like a Punnett square. So in a Punnett square, this person has the um, genotype, capital B, little b, so they're heterozygous. Their sperms, half of them have the big B, half of them have the little b. This person's eggs, half have the big B, half have the little b. And you can see here the different combinations of how those add up together. Variation is the differences between members of the same species and it affects your chances of survival. It can be discontinuous. For example, your blood type can be A, B, AB or O, but it can't be anything in between. And that is caused only by your genes. Or it can be continuous, which is caused by both your genes and your environment. Think about your height. Your height is affected partly by the genes of your parents. It's also partly affected by the diet that you're fed as a child. Topic four, natural selection and genetic modification. So Darwin's theory of evolution, it starts with environmental change. So something new happens, a new predator comes along, there's a climate change or whatever. Um, variation means that some members of the species are better able to handle that change. Natural selection means that the ones with better characteristics to handle that new change, they're more likely to breed and they're more likely to survive and pass on their genes. Um, this leads to inheritance. So those good genes are more likely to be passed on. Uh, so there can be more offspring with the better genes. And over time, this leads to evolution, the idea that that process repeats over many, many generations and eventually creates an entirely new species. Resistance describes how some species evolve the ability to overcome something that used to be deadly to them. For example, the way that rats can evolve resistance to rat poison or bacteria can overcome antibiotics. It works by variation. So there will always, for example, in this uh, one with bacteria, there will always be some bacteria who are naturally uh, more resistant to the antibiotics than others. If you take some antibiotics, those more resistant ones survive and will pass on their genes. And so the number of uh, ones that are resistant to the antibiotics will spread because the ones that weren't resistant died out. Selective breeding is what farmers do to improve the characteristics of their crops or their animals, and it works by selecting the ones with the best characteristics, then they're breeding them together and raising their offspring, then from the offspring selecting the ones with the best characteristics and breeding those together and repeating the process for many generations until you end up with a totally changed population. You can also change populations by genetic engineering. In genetic engineering, you take genes from one organism and insert them into another to create an organism with new characteristics. So you remove the desired gene that you want from the organism that's got that gene. You put it into the organism that you want to have that gene and then you breed the organism on and all of its offspring will contain that new gene with that new characteristic. Health disease. Now, disease is any problem with the body not caused by injury. They can be communicable, which means they can be spread, and those are caused by pathogens, or they can be non communicable, which means they cannot be spread, and that is caused by either your genes or your lifestyle. Non communicable diseases, um, one class is called malnutrition, which is getting too much or too little of certain nutrients, for example, obesity, getting too much fat and sugar, uh, and nutrient deficiencies such as quashial core, which is a lack of protein, scurvy, which is a lack of vitamin C rickets which is a lack of vitamin d and anemia caused by a lack of iron another um, non-communicable disease is liver disease caused by alcohol abuse this is properly known as cirrhosis and it is a permanent breakdown of the liver um, once you've got it you can't cure it you are on the path to death cardiovascular disease is uh, or heart disease is another type of non-communicable disease the biggest risk factor for it is obesity obesity is defined as having a body mass index of 30 or more body mass index is your mass divided by your height squared in cardiovascular disease what happens is the arteries that supply the heart with blood and nutrients um, get blocked by a substance called plaque this can lead to blockages that stop blood from flowing causing areas of the heart to be starved of oxygen leading to heart attacks Pathogens are microorganisms that cause disease. They can be bacteria, protists, fungi or viruses, um, and they can be spread in a number of ways, including direct contact um, through the air, through contaminated water, through um, contaminated body fluids, particularly through sexual transmission, um, through vectors, which are animals that can bite you and pass on to the disease, and through the oral route, so eating contaminated food. Some examples of that, cholera is caused by a bacteria which is waterborne and leads to very severe diarrhea. Tuberculosis is caused by bacteria um, which is airborne and leads to inflammation of the lungs, coughing up blood and eventual death. Um, colds and flu are caused by virus which is airborne. So someone sneezes, spray out a drop of mucus, uh, a, a mist of mucus and you breathe it in. Um, food poisoning is normally caused by bacteria on contaminated food. So that is the oral route. Um, hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola where you bleed to death uh, internally are caused by viruses which are spread by direct contact. 
HIV, which leads to AIDS, is caused by a virus spread through sexual contact or bodily fluids such as blood um, through uh, through sharing needles uh, with drug users and things like that. Um, Chalera ash dieback is a disease that affects trees and it's spread by fungus. It is airborne, so very, very difficult to control. And lastly, malaria, which gives you severe fever and chills and muscle aches and kills millions of people every year is caused by a protest uh, which is spread by mosquitoes biting you so they are a vector. Physical barriers block pathogens from entering us and they include the mucus inside our nose and lungs that uh, traps bacteria and the cilia that sweep those uh, sweep that mucus back up and out of the body. We have chemical defences that kill um, pathogens, for example, lysozyme, an enzyme in saliva and tears and mucus and sweat, which kills bacteria. And we also have hydrochloric acid in our stomach, which kills most of the pathogens on our food. The immune system destroys pathogens that enter the body and it works based on um, chemicals called antigens that are found on the surface of a pathogen, which are uh, chemical markers that identify them. Now, we make our own proteins called antibodies that stick to antigens and that will kill the pathogen. Now, each antibody has a shape to match a specific antigen. Uh, antibodies are made by lymphocytes. So when we first get infected, we'll have one particular lymphocyte that will have the right shape antibodies to stick to a pathogen and that will activate that lymphocyte and we can see that happening here so the pathogen is stuck to the lymphocyte there that lymphocyte will then get activated which means it will make squillions of copies of itself um, and it will start to flood the body with loads and loads of the right antibodies to kill that particular pathogen now some of those lymphocytes uh, once the pathogen has been killed some of those lymphocytes will hang around in our um, immune system as memory lymphocytes and the rest of the lymphocytes will die because we don't need them anymore um, this means that next time we meet that same pathogen, we've got lots of the memory lymphocytes ready to make lots of the right antibodies to kill the pathogen before it affects us again. Thank you for listening. The end.